Hello, welcome to series eight of the negotiation room. It's tremendous to be back. And you know, Gail, probably a little known fact, because I've never told anybody this before, that uh, we have today uh, gone well clear of the 10,000 mark in terms of the people who have joined us in the negotiation room. And I'm talking there, of course, about the audience, not our illustrious guests. And it is wonderful to have this next series starting off with, indeed, such an illustrious panel of guests. And we have the tremendous good fortune today to have attracted four outstanding practitioner negotiators uh, who have, uh, between us, a fairly significant accumulation of years of negotiation experience. So with that, Kel, let me hand over to you because uh, I don't know if we'd like to introduce you with happiness today. Yes, uh, it's amazing. Um, I've been so thrilled about our episode today. I'm normally very excited about our episode, but this one is, is special. And I want to start off thanking John for arranging everything. John is the is the guy who made all of this happen. Now, uh, Tim, uh, very quickly, when I was a kid, I grew up in Denmark and I was a big soccer fan. And um, I was actually a, a strong supporter of Liverpool, so I'm probably going to offend him right now. But um, what I remember back then was as a kid, you could put together your dream team of players from different teams, right? Um, and we were trying to pick the best players from different teams and then set up the dream team. And, and what I think we got here, Tim, today is a dream team of negotiators. You know, if anybody in the world ever would hire a group of four season negotiators, here they are. You know, we have experts, hands on negotiator, not just from laboratories or theories, but but real life uh, negotiation experts. So that's wonderful. Let, let me just introduce everybody. We have Jennifer Lambie, who is the managing director of Accenture. We have Arthur Kendras, who is the vice president of Kindle. We have uh, Michael Camarota, who is the managing director of PwC. And we have John. Uh, different fact that I know that a lot of our viewers knows already, who is the managing director of EY. John has joined us several times. So first and foremost, everybody, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it's going to be exciting. And as normal, uh, all our viewers can, can ask questions as we go along. I'm sure since we have a crowded house today, we're going to be quite busy. So I, I apologize already if we can't answer all questions, but we will definitely try to answer as much as we can. So um, we've had a little bit of, of, of an agenda today, which is unusual for Tim and I, but since we have that many people and we want to get as much information out of everybody as we can, um, we have planned just a tiny bit. And one thing we have planned is um, to ask everybody in the panel to explain very briefly how they ended up at the position they're in today. Because a question I often get, Tim, from clients and students is, how do I become a professional negotiator? You know, I just, I can't, I can't go to a university and pick a course saying how to become a professional negotiator. Um, so it's obviously coming from learning and doing and, and, and mistakes and errors. So the first question I would like to ask the panel is, uh, what, what happens? I mean, um, we were just making fun of it before we started today and, and we don't want to go back to something that started in 1900. So we agreed that everything just happened three months ago, but having <laughs> said that, how did you guys manage to end up doing what you're doing today at that level with that experience? I think the amount of experience you got is so useful for, for, for our, our audience. So um, that's the introduction. If you could give us a brief insight, what happened? Um, what have you learned uh, on, on the way uh, by negotiation? And perhaps even more importantly, what have you learned that you shouldn't do? Was there any major fails that you did that you want to share with, with any of us? And then after that, I have another question. And I think Jennifer it was okay if we could start with that uh, with you. So right now you want to know what happened and how I ended up here today, right? Yes. That yes. Cal, that is the best quote. Like, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, like all careers, it's never planned and it was never intended. Um, I started, I've been with Accenture my entire career. So I, I joined right out of college and um, was terrible at my job and thought I would barely last a year or two. Uh, fast forward through years and years and years, I ended up working on a team that focused on negotiations where John and I worked together. 
and it tweaked my interest in both business and social science. I am a social science nerd and I love figuring out how and why things happen the way they are. And focusing on that um, just fed that interest that I had personally of, of continuing to learn and grow. Um, I also like to talk to people. So it's, it's a natural outcome up there. And right now I am working um, on an account team for one of Accenture's clients. And mm -hmm. I would say that, you know, if you want to start negotiating, you actually do that all day, every day. Every conversation I have is a negotiation. It's not just when there's a contract, although, yeah, that comes up a lot. Um, and those are always really interesting, very focused, detailed examples. But every time I talk to people, it's negotiation. And you can make that um, the same for whatever you do. It's just uh, looking at it through a different lens. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, it's funny you're saying that, uh, Jennifer, and I just love what you said, that, that everything in life is, is a negotiation because I meet quite a lot of people uh, and, you know, I'm living and breathing negotiation when I ask them, so how many times do you negotiate per year? And they look very frustrated at me and said, I don't negotiate at all. And I'm thinking, my God, you, you, you actually misunderstood life because, you know, you get up in the morning and you start negotiating, at, at least with yourself. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of negotiation going on. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, uh, Mike. Um, I got hired by IBM right out of law school and they immediately threw me into doing real work. And then shortly after that, I got assigned over to that part of IBM that was starting the outsourcing business back in the late eighties, early nineties. So combined good place to be worked for really good people, watched really good people. And like Jennifer, I mean, I like people. I like interacting with people. I think that resonates with people when you you start to interact with them. I I also like to think chess, not checkers. And when you're negotiating, it really is important to kind of appreciate the other reality. The that you know you're going to have to plan three moves ahead. I guess the other piece is I'm I'm naturally somebody who wants to get along with everybody. And I'm, I'm a firm believer in good karma. So interacting with people, uh, always trying to be my true self, always trying to, you know, use a sense of humor to kind of lighten the situation. The other thing is, to be frank, I always kept in mind that the person across the table from me is my customer, whether they're an outside lawyer, retained firm, somebody from procurement, whoever they are, they're my customer. And I want to get along with them and I'm going to likely going to get along with them because I'm going to keep seeing them over and over again. Mm. And the other reality is it doesn't make sense to shoot somebody unless it's a headshot. <laughs> because if any can, if any of you can remember the, you know, Leo, the, the DiCaprio movie, when he shoots the bear, that's what it's like when you're, you're taking pot shots at people that you're negotiating with. It just isn't helpful because you're just going to make them mad. Right, right. So, you know, I, I kind of combine all the things into the notion of, okay, now I understand an industry, now I have an appreciation, but also I, I never, ever dismiss anybody. You know, I, I may have that initial reaction, which is this guy doesn't know what he's talking about, but immediately I turn that off and say, okay, pay attention. And I learn from everybody I deal with, and it mm. facilitates my ability to interact with them. Mm -hmm. Mm. What, what wonderful. I, I think there was an important lesson here for our viewers. The takeaway is always go for a headshot. Uh, <laughs> but, 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 but believe in good karma. So, so I, I think that was very useful. Thanks a lot, Mike. That was, that was extremely good. Um, Arthur? One consistent theme I think I'm seeing in all these discussions is there's a bit of a random walk in how we all became negotiators. Uh, I joined a large technology company that had a full suite of offerings. And the uh, program at the time was to rotate people through the different uh, components of the business, the hardware, the technology development, manufacturing, uh, and the sales organization. And I had a chance to see the different elements of the business. And the one that I found the most compelling uh, and the most attractive really were the group negotiations, where we put together a team consisting of a lawyer, a negotiator, uh, a pricer from finance, a technical solution developer, and uh, come together and present a unified proposal to a customer. And it, it almost had a narcotic effect. 
very exciting, uh, very compelling, and a chance to work with people. And the other side always makes it interesting. So that was really my introduction. And I elected to go down that path and specialize in that particular area. Mm, okay. Right. Well, perfect. Thank you so much, Arthur. Um, last but not least, John. Sure. Thank you very much, Kel. But actually, my my negotiation journey started really with a stroke of luck uh, because I had not planned on becoming a deal guy. I was a newspaper reporter in Albany, New York, and I went to law school to become a litigator. But then rather than joining a law firm at a school, I joined IBM and was fortunate, fortunate enough to be placed in the outsourcing division where IBM was doing its largest technology deals. And that's how I got to work with Mike and Arthur. And uh, within months, I was working on multi-year deals worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And Mike and I did a couple deals together. We did an outsourcing deal with Pertz. And I know we're not supposed to talk about what things were like in the old days, but it just reminded me of how technology has evolved. That when we did that, when Mike and I did that deal with Hertz, we were writing contracts on a mainframe software application. And if you wanted to send the client a draft, you either had to fax it or FedEx it. You didn't have Word, you didn't have email, and the internet didn't exist. So frankly, I, I don't know how we got things done when I think about it. Uh, so I left IBM, and then I joined Accenture, uh, where I quit being a lawyer and joined a team of full-time negotiators slash salespeople who only worked on Accenture's biggest, messy deals. And that's when I got to work with Jen. So I, I spent eight years uh, on the same team with Jen, and that was really a huge turning point because it was an intensive immersion into negotiation theory, negotiation practice and execution. And somewhere along the way, I recruited Mike to leave IBM and join Accenture. And then I left EY, I left Accenture to join EY to build the same kind of big deal team. So today I lead a team of 11 full-time negotiations for the Americas um, in EY. And I teach and write and have a blog called Running the Room. I've been writing for the last 10 years and I love my job. Uh, I have a terrific team of professionals and I'm just something of a negotiation nerd at this point, if that's such a thing, so. Thank, thank you so so much, John. And um, I just thought there was a comment from from Rod uh, Wade out in the uh, out, out in the chat room right now, where he says another former journalist in contract and negotiation. Um, I've often been been wondering, John, um, if journalists aren't naturally born negotiator because they are skilled and trained and educated in asking questions. And obviously, where I'm coming from, questions is key in being a a great a great negotiator. Would would, would you agree with that, John? Yeah, it, it is. I also had the fortune of landing in two professions, the law and journalism, where you do have to probe and ask questions. You're always fact gathering. And right. as Jen said, you know, when she talked about social science, there is so much social science involved mm -hmm. in negotiation right. in terms of understanding emotion and personalities and behaviors and, and interaction and so forth. So, yes, it, it was hugely helpful to begin right. uh, as a newspaper reporter. Mm, wonderful. Jennifer, uh, I'm so happy you're here for several reasons. And one of them is you're a woman. And, and the reason I'm saying that is I see too many men in this business simply because I know women in general, and I'm generalizing, are better negotiators than men. I don't know whether you would agree or disagree with that fact. Tim and I actually had an expert in the field, a um, uh, 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 professor on who has been studying this area very, very um very detailed. And she actually said women are better uh, negotiating than men when they're negotiating in somebody else's interest. But mm -hmm. when they're negotiating in their own interest, they become worse than men. How, how, how do you feel about that take, Jennifer? Um, Cal, that is another hat that I have worn in my negotiation expertise is I ran a program um, that Accenture had for a time on women in negotiation. So uh, although every woman in on this is going to hate to hear this, it is empirically data-driven, factually true. Mm -hmm. um, as much as you can you know, factually study uh, negotiations as social science, but you can enough. So mm -hmm. it's true. Mm -hmm. um, women advocate on behalf of others really well. Mm -hmm. So... Um, we are excellent in going and advocating for things that we know people need, whether that's your, you know, your, your margin you need, uh, people on your team needing extra time, uh, a sale that's needed, a deal structure, 
we're great at that. Um, the challenge is when you're negotiating for yourself personally. Mm, yeah. um, I studied a lot with a, worked with a professor who um, has studied this, Linda Babcock, and she's written a few books in this space. And, um, you know, uh, some of the research that's come out since then, I said women are going and they're negotiating, they're asking more. Um, the, the outcome isn't as good. But mm. I think we have to get away from that because mm. uh, it goes to a fallacy that, well, I should be getting what I want because I'm asking. And that's not the case mm. at all with negotiation. What you mm. need to do is be able to always see things as a, a puzzle that right. you're trying to piece together and you're right. trying to come up with a better idea and a better option. Right. Um, right. But I am glad and clearly, you know, you needed uh, another... Uh, young woman here to balance off the experience of uh, men. So glad to play that role here today. Oh, that's wonderful, Jennifer. Another question I have for you is, um, how do you see the impact of emotions in, in negotiation in general and, and how to manage uh, emotions in negotiation? I'm, I'm asking because sometimes I meet negotiator who says, well, emotions and, and negotiations are two different things, you know, and there shouldn't be any emotions in negotiation. And I typically find there's nothing but emotions in negotiations. Well, that's a great question, Cal. And I'm going to start with the fact that I have an RBF. <laughs> and for today, to keep this clean, I'll call it a resting bad face. <laughs> and it is just the way my face naturally forms when I'm serious and when I'm thinking and concentrating. And I've been working on it and things like this are great because I'm staring at my face the entire time and I'm trying to perfect it so I don't look clown-like like with some silly grin and I've got a good balance. But I can't, can't do that always. And like my face is kind of tired right now because we've been at this for 20 minutes and I've been trying to to not look like that. Why do I say that? People judge me. They assume I am having certain emotions that I'm not based on that. And it, it's implicit, right? They don't even know they're doing it. But when you're on a, when you're on a negotiation and we should always be on video with people all the time, all the time. And I look like this, I'm judged. People don't feel like I appreciate them. They don't feel a sense of affiliation. You know, there's just something wrong and they don't get it. So that goes into the main concepts on emotion. Um, there's a, a book that you guys have probably talked about. Everyone knows beyond reason. It's using emotions as you negotiate by Fisher and Shapiro. It's my favorite because it takes negotiation and it makes it something that is studyable, empirical, things you can focus on. There's five, oh, can't see my hand, five core concerns, five things you have to pay attention to. Hmm. Um, three, start with the letter A to help you remember. You can Google this pretty fast. Appreciation, affiliation, and autonomy. Then the other two are status and role. So you, you have to, I, I like this because it gives you a structure. You need a structure because if you don't in social science, it all goes crazy. So you have to use this as a way to diagnose and look at how other people are perceiving you hmm. and how you're perceiving them. Hmm. Um, so appreciation is, is obvious, right? You have, you, have to, you have to send forth a feeling, I'm glad you're here today. I'm glad we're able to sit down and talk about this. You have to hmm. have some sense of affiliation. So, hmm. and, and the more you have, I find with this one, it's my favorite, the better. You have to have some kind of connection because mm. this is a personal game. Mm. It, it is, you can try to make it all data driven and legitimate, but if people think you're an ass Cal, oops, sorry, I censored my, <laughs> should censor myself there. Um, it doesn't matter how much data, and if they have to take your, uh, you know, what you're offering, they're not gonna like it. That's the third one, autonomy. Like people wanna feel like they can choose what they, what they want. Right. Um, and then status and role are obviously respecting, identifying what people, uh, what their status is within an organization and what their role on the negotiation is. So those five things, I did a very quick summary of them, but you need, you need to be thinking about that to diagnose and, and improve. 
Mm. And you're, to answer your question at the very end, um, emotion is a natural human um, state and mm. you cannot turn it off or mm. separate it. And if you think you are doing it, you are silly and wrong because <laughs> it is not possible. Yeah. But what you can do is pay attention to it mm. and recognize what's going on and work on how, what triggers you or how to master it. Um, mm. And you know, it doesn't always work. Mm. And we're humans, but whatever you can do to try to, at the beginning, impart some sense of human to human connection with the people you're talking to mm. helps mm. a lot because it starts to, um, to level set everything where we are. And you mm. asked, to talk about when it didn't work well. So I did have somebody who I was in a contract negotiation with who um, try, tried this a little bit and said to me, oh dear, I see you've gotten upset. Mm. Perhaps we should take this and do this another time. Mm. And it was a, a try to say, hey, you know, maybe we should come back. But the way it was delivered pissed me off even more <laughs> because it was somewhat, you know, condescending and, oh, right. I see you've gotten upset. Right. Um, right. Now, how would you deliver that? You know, it seems like maybe mm. we should just pick this up and, you know, let's, let's take a break. You right. can make up the need for a break. Oh no, hang on. I've got a important call coming in. Mm. Oh gosh, I've got to take this. I mean, anything like that to try to diffuse things when they get upset. So Mm. Anyway, that's a quick overview mm. of emotion. And I love talking about it mm. and would recommend if you want to learn more, read Beyond Recent. Mm -hmm. I, I would absolutely agree, Jennifer. I actually had Dan Sapiro from Harvard uh, on a webinar last week where we discussed my oh, new great. book. Dan is one of my favorites within the world of negotiation. He's, mm. he's brilliant. I would definitely yeah. um, agree with you. Uh, Beyond Reason is a great book. Um, another, another author and researcher within the field, Daniel Kahneman, who won the Nobel Prize in economics, um, he's called the father of behavioral economics, is another author. He's wrote, written several books that I would recommend as well. He claims that we are all 100% irrational. So we buy with emotions and then we document our decision that is emotional with facts that we add later on. And we don't mm -hmm. even know we're doing it. So he says our starting point is irrational behavior. Um, so that's an interesting angle as well. And, and as I said, he won the Nobel Prize and his philosophy about that. So thank you so much for, for sharing, Jennifer. Very, very useful. I, I love that. Um, let's move on with uh, Mike. Uh, and the question for you, Mike, is uh, do you find companies are focused more or less on the world of negotiation, the art or the skill or whatever we call it? Um, do they focus more or less on negotiation as the key uh, discipline and drive of a business? more today than, than they've done before? Uh, I, I have to answer it depends on the company. I have seen companies get very focused on it. For example, I'm on a project now at PwC where we're focusing on facilitating our ability of our salespeople to be better at what they're doing. And one aspect of that is going to be negotiations. The flip side is I've been at places that really haven't placed much of an emphasis on it. And I, I think there's one thing we have to keep in mind. First of all, the people that are on this call have already crossed the Rubicon. They've decided I'm going to educate myself. But mm. part of the reality for any good negotiator is you're probably dealing with some really smart people. Half of those smart people will recognize they need you because they're just not good negotiators. Unfortunately, half of them, because they're smart, think they're smart at everything and will try to be negotiators without understanding how to negotiate. Mm. So it becomes very difficult with those individuals to really get them to a place where they can provide meaningful reactions to the people that they're dealing with because they're simply not attuned to the realities of what it is to negotiate. Mm. So again, there's different people doing different things. Uh, but I would encourage the people on this call to do what they're doing, which is to educate themselves and to pay attention to what state of art and what are best practices. Hmm. Right. Absolutely. I, I think that's a wonderful piece of, of, of advice, Mike. 
Um, I, I sometimes meet people that come to me and say, well, I have 23 years of experience in the world of, of negotiation. Uh, and I don't want to offend anybody, but once in a while, I find that they actually don't have 23 years of experience. They have one year of experience. They just repeat it 23 times. And and obviously, in my world, that's not 23 years of experience if you're just repeating the same thing over and over again. So I completely agree, Mike. It's really about, <laughs> about developing as well. It's really about learning something new all the time, isn't it? And 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 moving on. And and I have found that negotiation is like a moving target. It's It's changing as well. So what might have worked that not that any of us in the room right now are any older than we only been negotiating for what what was it, John, six months? But but you know, if 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 we look at it, you know, it it has really moved on. So that's I, I think that's a wonderful uh, concept you just shared there, Mike. Thank you so much. Um John. Keld, if I Keld, if I could just pose yeah. a question to Mike, because he because this uh this question you've asked raises an interesting point. Uh and I'm actually curious what the other panelists think as well. Do you believe that having an inexperienced negotiator on the other side of the table or a highly skilled negotiator on the other side of the table is better for your deal? So that's directed at you, Mike, just in terms of, you know, how people, how companies are looking at negotiation and training people, which would you rather have on the other side of the table? Somebody who doesn't really know what they're doing or somebody who is as experienced as you are at negotiation. I, I think we lost Mike right now. You probably really oh. here. Oh, okay. I'll jump in, John. I always sure. prefer someone more experienced on the other side. I think it's much more efficient and we're all about efficiency. Uh, otherwise, with a uh, more of a novice, you end up going down rabbit holes and having to do a bit of education about what might be market, what might be more typical. So I always prefer the much more uh, experienced uh, person across the table. And in fact, the brighter, the better, because it's a two-way street. I learn a lot too. So uh, yeah. I always favor uh, an experienced uh, opponent, if you will. Yeah. What, what, yeah. What, 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 what's your take on that question, Jennifer? Oh, absolutely. Experienced. Because if you have an inexperienced person, like Arthur said, you have to educate them. And sometimes they're pretty convinced that their way happens to be more appropriate. Hmm. Um, and you know, some might say, oh, well, I could, you know, get a better deal. But in the end, they'll figure it out or somebody will come to them and say, why did you sign this? Why did you sign right. up for this? Right. Um, and then you have to go back and it doesn't create any trust or goodwill. Yeah, so right. yeah, absolutely. I, uh, 100%. Yeah. Yeah, I, I asked because I thought that would be a bit of a surprise to the audience to hear from a group of experienced negotiators that we don't want a rookie who we can quote unquote take advantage of because no. you, you don't get all they do then is they say no to everything and you can't progress, you can't collaborate. So I want somebody who's like me that's like, let's get something amazing done together. Yeah, I, I would absolutely agree, John. I think it's a wonderful thing you just shared that. Because I think, unfortunately, there are people out there who think it's way better sitting with somebody who's on experience on the other side. I often compare that to, to play tennis. I don't know if there's any of you guys that play tennis. I do. I'm not very good at it. But when I'm playing with somebody who's worse than me, I almost lose because I get so frustrated that they can't figure out to play the game, right? But when I'm playing with somebody that is way better than me, and that happening most of the time, um, I'm actually doing better because I'm just enjoying the game. And I often see that in negotiations as well. When I'm sitting across the table from somebody who's really good at it, 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 it it's an art, right? It really becomes wonderful to look at. And the whole negotiation process is so much better for everybody. So uh, great question, John. Thank you so much. Um, John, question for you. What developments have you seen uh, in how people view and handle negotiation throughout your, your career? The biggest evolution that uh, I've noticed is the shift in emphasis from teaching people negotiation tactics to explaining how to create a negotiation strategy. Um, I recall reading Herb Cohen's book many years ago. I won't give any dates. You can negotiate anything and being struck by a sense of gamemanship and tricks that he had to get people to agree. It felt very tactical uh, and manipulative. And it's actually ironic that he published that book in 1982 and Roger Fisher and William Urey published Getting to Yes in 1981. So the notion of collaborative and disciplined negotiations was running in parallel to Herb Cohen's philosophy of more positional 
and they introduce ZOPA and understanding your BATNA and the strategic importance of assessing the other party's BATNA, which I think was somewhat revolutionary. Mm -hmm. uh, so that shift that we've had to collaboration has necessitated the importance of emotional intelligence. Jennifer talked to, uh, before about social science, listening, awareness, because people started to become more cognizant of what a negotiation is really about, right? If you, if you reduce it down to its bare essentials, it's words. Mm. That's all it is. That's all we have. It's words. It's a conversation between two or more parties to see if they can come to a mutual agreement on an issue or a series of issues. That's what a negotiation is. So you have to prepare for that conversation and think carefully about what words am I going to use to create the greatest potential to influence the other party to agree? Because in all cases, in a negotiation, you're trying to influence the other party to change their thinking from here to mm. over here. Mm. So what tools do we have other than words? And they've got to be the right words at the right time with the right person. You have to have all three to really be influential because the right words with the wrong person at the right time won't do you any good because you're not talking to the decision maker. Mm. And the right words to the right person at the wrong time will fail because you haven't laid a foundation for what it is you're trying to do. So if it feels to me like the general tenor of negotiations has gone from this notion of seeing if you can beat the other guy and get a better deal to leveraging psychology and EQ to influence the other party to agree that what you're proposing is better for both of you than what the other party was originally asking for. Right, right. Um, just getting back to Professor Dan Sapiro that Jennifer mentioned previously. Um, one of the things I love in his work is that he talks about the tribal effect, that we're all tribal. And he says it's actually gone worse. We are more in a tribe now than ever before, which have actually resulted in we are getting worse at listening to each other, especially mm -hmm. in negotiations as well. Yeah. And um, so, so that means, John, if you're saying something and I'm disagreeing with you, I'm, I'm just I'm just thinking you're wrong. I, I don't have empathy. I'm not actually listening and respecting what you're saying. I'm just concluding that you're wrong and I'm right. Um, and and if Dan Sapiro is right, um, that's actually that's actually very sad, isn't it? If we are, yeah. if if we're going in 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 that direction, what's what's your take on that, John? Yeah, I I definitely uh, have seen that as well. That it has we've become very positional in certain aspects of our culture. Obviously, in in politics, it's gotten that way, um, and that's it. It is harder, to, and I think probably the problem is people still think they can change other people's minds and they're not willing to just live with things the way that they are. It's almost like a, a red flag to a bull that if you see somebody who has a different view, you need to go at them and somehow fix that or beat them down or something like that. And so it's gotten very, feels very positional in a lot of the conversations that we're having on social issues and political issues these days. And the science has shown the way to solve for that is not to try to convince the other party that they're right. There's a great a great book about a, um, a black activist who engaged members of the Ku Klux Klan and just kept meeting with them, socializing with them and just basically opening up their world to them mm -hmm. and understanding where they were coming from. And over time, found that they started to drop their guard and started to understand, yeah, the world is much more complex. It's not literally black and white in, in right. terms of the way that we're looking at things. So it's right. that notion of taking away the sense of I need to change your mind to I need you to understand my point of view and how I'm seeing this and how that has us in this situation. Can you share with me the same from you so we can figure out how we can change this situation? Right, right. John, I have a good uh, story about that. Cal, I'll just uh, interrupt with a story here without being asked. <laughs> you know that I, I have work and experience in, uh, in the public sector, working in um, state and local government and doing negotiations there. And some people might say, well, you can't negotiate there, which um, isn't, is not true. You just have to do it differently. And um, I was in a situation where we had the exact thing, John, where I, I was unable to reach conclusion over email trading red lines, but getting on the phone and having a one-on-one -on -one where I sat down and said, hey, you know, this specific, um, it was a service level agreement that was rather onerous. 
And I said, I, you know, I, the reason we can't do this is because, and I explained everything and the procurement executive I was working with said, oh, okay, well, what if we do this? And we went back and forth. We solved it in, I don't know, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. And I had set up the call saying, hey, can we talk? Because we've been trading emails a lot. And I bet if we just solve this ourselves, we could figure it out. And while there are rules and guidelines for any type of government um, RFPs or contracting, there are also ways around and through them. And um, when you have somebody who just falls on the rule, well, sorry, I can't do it because of the rules, just find somebody who gets the bigger picture and they'll know how to change it and make a solution that works. Mm -hmm. But you have to go in and have that um, just very open one-on-one -on -one small conversation to, to unlock some of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's 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 a that's a great story. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Yeah, Arthur, um, um, back to you. Have you found if there's a more efficient way to go through negotiations um, in your forty years of deal making? Sorry about the forty years of deal making, but but <laughs> in your forty years of deal making, uh, have you found any way that is more efficient? Have Have you found a shortcut to to create the great negotiation, Arthur? And when we prepared for this, you had a, a follow on to that question. You said, do you have to make the cake by scratch every time? Yes. Uh, so I've been uh, thinking about your cake baking metaphor. And I do bake, uh, especially bread, and can to attest that a recipe is but a guide. Uh, there are numerous variables in baking, the humidity in the air, the ambient temperature, the amount of moisture and the flour, when the harvest, when the flour was harvested, it all generates varying results. So you've got this recipe where you think you're going to get a very specific result, uh, but there are variations to it. And I'll, I'll analogize that to negotiations. First of all, it's a human endeavor. And I think every panelist has underscored that point so, so far. It's really more of an artisanal process. It's not an industrial process where you've got a tightly controlled environment and you can guarantee precisely the same result with the same inputs every time. And uh, I embrace that because the variability is what keeps it fresh and interesting to me uh, for the oh, six months or so that I've been doing this as a professional. Uh, <laughs> Also, underlying your question, Kelt, is that there's a search for a repeatable rules and repeatable techniques that can be used to increase efficiency. And that search is very understandable since humans like rules or like to pretend that these rules work and that we can get formulas that will have repeatable, predictable results. And people think if they've used got a positive outcome from a particular approach, they're quite likely to repeat that and expect the same happy outcome. But frankly, I'm feeling contrarian today and like to point out that the same technique that results in success oftentimes doesn't work uh, when you've got a new context, a new situation. Uh, one example I used, I worked with a very successful salesperson uh, who encountered price gaps uh, in trying to sell to his clients. And he developed a very complex, fancy method of long-term financing. He had to get a private equity firm uh, involved to do it. And it was able, he was able to bridge the gap against his lower price competitors by offering a very clever financing for a long-term service contract, which is a little unusual. Uh, and he did that several times. Uh, then I engaged with him and we were selling to a very large, very successful insurance company uh, in the US. And once again, we found ourselves with a price gap uh, and uh, we were too high. And the, uh, uh, the salesperson went to the same bag of tricks, went to the same uh, result and said, here it is, I can help uh, close this particular price gap through financing. It didn't work here because the insurance company was flush with cash and they had several quarters. And I remember the CIO saying, I don't need financing. I need a brilliant technical solution. You're focusing on the wrong thing. Forget the price gap. You've got to give me a compelling solution. So the technique had worked several times before. It failed here. So it was like using old flour or flour that was too wet. You don't get the same result. And humans like to think, well, it worked before. It's going to work again. And that's not true at all. So I'll push back on the premise of your question. Uh, mm -hmm. I can't be completely contrarian. Uh, even though it's fun to be contrarian, uh, there are certain things that, uh, in fact, uh, are the same time to time. And we all know that we've made reference to the very broad amount of uh, negotiation literature out there. Prepare your research, know what the other party's needs are, setting clear goals, what are your must-haves, 
building rapport, which Jen talked about, all really important stuff. Uh, and we've got to take advantage of those tools. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, I would say that in the end, flexibility and adaptability when applying the recipe are key. And each negotiation is unique. And, and the best approach is to really will vary depending on the context and the parties involved. So I don't think the recipe uh, metaphor works. And mm -hmm. I open it up for a spirited debate on that point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have a... I have a uh, sales sales leader of our team, uh, Ted Landis, who said, "If you've seen one deal, you've seen one deal, uh, because every one of them is going to be different for exactly the reasons you mentioned, Arthur. Once you throw the human element into there, once you throw the emotional element into there, you you just have no idea what direction this is going to go in. Right, and that right. makes it fun. Yeah, yeah it does." I, I, I completely agree, Arthur, with everything you said. I quite often tell my audience that you're not allowed to assume and you're not allowed to guess. And the reason I'm saying that, just back to what you mentioned right now, John, is I meet too many people out there who are saying, well, I've done it a million times before. I know exactly what they want. I know exactly what they're going to say. I know exactly what they're going to ask for. And I'm normally trying to provoke a little by saying, no, you don't. <laughs> um, because they may have completely different interests than you think they might have. You know, they might have different points, different target points, different costs, different values. You know, we 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 never know. So I I love that quote, John. If you've seen one deal, you have seen one one deal. Um, I just want to remind everybody that you can ask questions. Um, so please do because we have, as we talked about already, a very experienced uh, panel here, and I see a lot of comments out in 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 the chat already. So please uh, have that going. Um, Mike, welcome back. Um, we we, we you. missed you for, for, for a little bit there. And uh, since you are back, I, I want to um, utilize the opportunity to ask you a question. If you should share with our audience one thing and one thing only, I know this is a difficult question, um, that you would pass on as a key advice being a professional negotiator, um, what would that one thing be? Be a human being. Okay. And, and you, you'll find that at some point, there'll be another human being on the other side. You know, right. in thinking about what to say today, there, there was a lawyer that I used to deal with, and I called him the Antichrist. <laughs> why, was, why did I call him the Antichrist? Because he was the Antichrist. <laughs> and I tried so hard to deal with him at a human being level, and it just didn't work. Mm -hmm. But then I realized that he was having the same effect on his own clients that he was having on me. Right. So okay. part of it was I had a, the ability to establish a human connection because I was trying really hard to be human. All right. And ultimately, he became ineffective because everybody saw him for what he was, which was the Antichrist. Right. So right. It, it, I, do, I do think however hard the, the negotiation is, however difficult the people are that you're dealing with, there is likely going to be at least one person on the other side who will identify with somebody who is actively trying to be a human being, demonstrating business acumen, understanding of the issues and everything else. But once you have that human connection, I do think it facilitates the ability to get to somebody else on the other side who's thinking the same way. So I, I'm, I'm curious, Mike, did, did, did you manage to, to deal with that antichrist individual or, or, or did he eventually leave the whole negotiation? Um. In, in many cases, his, his own client asked him to leave. Okay. And it was kind of funny one day. We had two meetings. The first meeting went horribly, hmm. and he was there. The second meeting went well, and the senior business client said, you know, wow, this meeting is so much better than the last meeting we had. And then my business client at the time, who was pretty irascible, said, yeah, and guess who's not here today? <laughs> so you know but a lot of it be became important to understand you know he he had the same playbook he was a one trick pony mm -hmm. and what one of the things that he would typically do was you'd have a meeting you would think you have a meeting of the minds mm -hmm. but he kept delaying sending back the markup right and right. he would pick the last day of your fiscal quarter send you back a markup look nothing like right what you talked about He'd apologize and say, well, I'm sorry if I got it wrong, but, you know, if you want to get this signed today, this is the agreement we're going to sign because I can't get my business clients to, to get together to do something different. You know, and after the first time he did that, you warned your business client, OK, this is what's going to happen. You need to take these steps to make sure it doesn't. Hmm. So right. it really becomes a function of 
I never was able to establish the human connection, but the flip side was I was able to establish the human connection with the other people, as did the team, who then pointed out, this is what you're dealing with. Right. And we were able to get around it. Yeah. Jennifer, how would you deal with a counterpart like that? I would be my true self. I can't be anything else other than what I am. And if that resonates with somebody other than this individual, great. Because at some point, you know, particularly if you're dealing with somebody who's an outside influencer, or outside law firm or a consultant, you're going to find somebody on the other side who is not going to be appreciative of what it is they're going to do. That happens most of the time. Can't say it happens all of the time. But sooner or later, you know, disingenuous, dishonest character shows itself. Oh. And to the extent that you're being consistently who you are and human and everything else, that tends to facilitate the ability for the people to deal with you that way. All right. If I can follow uh, Mike's comments, uh, the advice I give people who are starting out in negotiation is just be your authentic self, which I think mm -hmm. ties to what Mike was saying. And so often people, when they start out, try and become like Darth Vader. And they think they're going to overwhelm and overpower the other side. And I always say, no, 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 no. You're trying to get a collaborative, long-term, useful relationship. And that is not the right approach. Uh, mm -hmm. And there's no way you're going to change yourself uh, to create a, a sense of honesty and transparency and collaboration. You can't hide who you are. So you have to embrace who you are uh, and really be authentic. And that's hard to do oftentimes in a professional setting. Oh, right. I, I find negotiation is one of the most freeing things you can do because you can be completely open and authentic. I, um, I have trouble with people who play games like that. I have trouble with people who try to, you know, they think they're being cool and secretive, but, and you can spot that a mile away. So negotiation is the most open, freeing, authentic thing you can do because if you can, if you can see it that way, that you are just trying to understand the other person and share your your point of view with them, and then you can be as open as possible. Yeah, mm. yeah. I I think there's a lot of people who haven't done it a lot don't appreciate how fun it can actually be to be in negotiation, and that mm. you can do fun things mm. in a negotiation. There's things you can try. And so to your point. Jennifer, about showing the other side, your point of view. I had a negotiation, you know, classic, I'm on one side of the table, the client's on the other side of the table, my lawyer was sitting next to me, and my lawyer got into it with their lawyer. And they were going back and forth on a minor point, and I actually thought they had the better argument. So I stood up, I said, let me see what happens here. I stood up and I walked around the table, and I sat down next to their lawyer. And... Uh -huh. Everybody looked at me like I had broken the fourth wall, like I'd walked <laughs> off the screen or something. And I waited till the two lawyers stopped talking and their lawyer looked at me like this. And I said to my lawyer, I'm sitting over here because I agree with him. And yeah. everybody laughed. So it kind of, you know, broke up the tension yeah. of what was going on and said, OK, you know, we can have some fun here. But the point I was trying to make to the client was. I can be influenced to agree with you when you have a legitimate point. I'm not going to oppose your point of view just for the sake of opposing it. I, I will look for the reason in what you're saying. And, right. you know, we had fun with the moment. I landed the point. And then, of course, I had to apologize to my lawyer for throwing him under the bus. But I told him what the strategy was. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, John, I, why are you even sitting across the table from them? We're supposed to be, you're supposed to I know, like, I know, you're supposed to, to be next to them. There, I know. So it was their room it was their conference room and we'd show up and they were all on one side and so we, right. we had right. no choice but couldn't you like sit on the end or something or yeah you know wheel your chair around i don't know i probably would have yeah. done that but it, no you're absolutely right i mean however you can break up the paradigm yes. To, yes. you know s swap things out it, it really helps and and the one thing i will also say that it, it sounds somewhat it sounds somewhat uh, nefarious, but when you do stuff in a negotiation because you're comfortable, everybody starts to realize, OK, this is the person who understands what they're doing and how this gets done, because they have a level of comfort with the baseline. And now they're improvising on top of it. 
So that's the professional in the room, which mm -hmm. goes to this notion of to be successful, you've got to learn how to run the room. You've got to re learn how to take everybody in there, get them all to collaborate, move them forward. And so the more that you will improvise and you do suggest things and you become creative, the more that you will empower yourself to be that professional that everybody's saying, let's have Jen get in here because she knows how to get deals done. Absolutely. So a question came in while we were talking. I, I wanted to respond to if that's OK. So, Regina, when you're facing that tough negotiating day, one of the things that I do was th there was a movie way back when all that jazz about Bob Fosse and the character every day when he woke up would look in the mirror, slap his hands together and say, it's showtime. And I remember that vividly because when in my early days in the IBM outsourcing group, Arthur, who I worked for, would send me into a negotiation and it was me and eight other lawyers on the other side. <laughs> and every single day I had to just kind of psych myself up to, OK, we're going to have at it and just keep going as far as I could go. Right. So, you know, it's one of those things to just focus on, OK, I'm going to get the, the day done. It's It's going to go. Nobody's going to die. Nobody's going to get killed. It's, and what was the other expression, John, we used to hear a lot? It's only money and it ain't my money. So, you know, <laughs> just kind of focus on what you need to get done and then do the best you can to deal with it. Yeah, yeah. it's 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 showtime. Yeah, we, 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 <laughs> have to, uh, we have to recall that. Um, Jennifer, same question to you. If there's one thing and one thing only that you should point out to everybody here, today um, that you've learned throughout your, your career, one thing that is a really important tool, uh, what would that thing be? Only one? Yeah. Oh, gosh. I think the most important thing is probably what I've already stressed, which is absolutely be yourself. And I know we say that a lot, but what does that really feel like and mean? And if you want to, you, you have to build the rapport with people and it doesn't matter, uh, you know, how articulate your arguments are. Uh, I had an old boss that said, if you torture the data long enough, it will talk. You can find the legitimacy to, to meet whatever you want it to be and you can mm. find it, but you have to be able to solve problems together and whatever you can do to create that sense of positivity, of um, connection, of energy. Don't feel like you have to come, you know, very buttoned up with your materials and you're going to present them because it, it, it doesn't go well. People want to talk about their issues. So that would be my, my number one thing. Be comfortable with yourself and build that, um, that connection. Wonderful. Thank you so much. John, same question to you. Yeah, I, I think it is focusing on, and Jen said it before, the and my favorite too is affiliation. Uh, deals, deals are done on the basis of trust mm -hmm. and you cannot get a yes from the other party unless there is some level of trust between you because decision-making, and this is something I, I don't think a lot of people appreciate it in our business, a client never chooses the best service provider. The client yeah. always chooses the service provider least likely to screw up. Mm -hmm. It's about risk mitigation and it's about putting down the red flags and showing we're going to make you successful. And mm -hmm. the secret sauce on top of that is being able to have trust where they say, I'm going to put my my lot in with you and trust mm -hmm. that you are, in fact, going to make me successful. So that wow. starts with building affiliation. That starts with knowing a little bit about the other party and how can I find, we talked about the tribal connections with people of where are we related? How I, I'll tell one quick story about uh, uh, somebody who Jen and I worked with who was on a deal in Japan. And he was a big guy, a former army guy, about six, four, and he was working with a Japanese client. And there you could not have had two people who had less in common in terms of, you know, trying to find something. And he walked into the office of the client and noticed roses and pictures of roses. And he, as they were talking, he said, I noticed the pictures. He said, are you a Rosarian? And the client said, yes, I am. He said, oh my gosh. He said, I thought that was a Queen Elizabeth Rose. And bam, 
They right. built this thin line of trust because the, I never even heard the word Rosarian before. I didn't know that people who love roses are called Rosarians, but that's what they are. So that right. thin line of trust was all he needed to get started and was able yeah. to build on that and get the deal done. And by the time it was done, you know, they were best friends and exchanging gifts with each other. Yes. yes. It, it, it's very interesting. It's those small things, isn't it? Some, sometimes that all it takes uh, to, mm -hmm. to, uh, to, to connect. That leads me on to a question we got from Emma. And that's really a question to all of you guys in the panel. Uh, what tips do we have for dealing with a difficult character? Examples of being difficult is when a customer states they, they will walk away um, or they state their high position to you. Um, I think we touched upon it a little bit, but but could any, any of you expand a little bit on this uh, on this question from, uh, from Emma? Well, I think the, the number one thing is to recognize that they have the ability to walk away. That's autonomy right there. Like, mm -hmm. yes, you, you could, absolutely. We... We recognize that you have many choices um, for, you know, whatever your problem is. Mm. And, you know, we think that what we've presented to you is the best choice from what we know of what you have, because it, you know, then fill in the blank, solves problems, one, three, five, seven, nine, 12. Mm. Um, and we'd love to learn more about them. And, you know, just a, a quick, um, quick summary like that. But I think, yeah, those are games generally, because if they were going to walk away and go to somebody else, they wouldn't be sitting there talking to you. Sure. Um, so having that discussion saying, yes, you know, recognize you can and would love to get your feedback on what what we're doing and what you like about it and what you don't like about it. And asking for feedback is another thing because people love to give feedback and tell you right. what they think about your solution. Right, right, absolutely. Anybody else who want to share anything on that question? I'll, I'll tease you a little bit, Kelvin, and say I've never really encountered a difficult personality on the other side. Right. Uh, we'll see people who are perhaps early in the progress uh, in the road to becoming a collaborative partner and helping them along that road uh, takes a mm -hmm. few steps. But you have to think long term and think about the end game. And there might right. be some bumps early on, but it's an evolution. So, right, right. Unfortunately, we're almost running out of time, but uh, I haven't asked you yet, um, Arthur, one thing, one takeaway thing, if you should share that from your uh, very successful career, what would that thing be at the negotiation table that you would pass on to, to the rest of us? In 32 seconds, uh, mm. still all my knowledge, that'll be easy. I won't even need all 32 seconds. No, flexibility and adaptability. It's a very right. creative process, focus on innovation. Uh, I think that would be, those would be the high level. That would be my high level response. Thank you so no, much. No recipes, Kelt, no recipes. Right, I, I completely agree. No recipe, the, the, the bread is going to be different every time. <laughs> I was actually, my intention was to do a summary of everything we talked about, but we simply don't have time. There's been so many useful things and I hope our audience appreciate all the gold that was really served here on the table. There's been so much useful stuff in the last hour. Um, first and foremost, I want to thank all of you to taking a time to be here. I know you got a busy schedule. It was really useful. And I would love to repeat this session if you enter it at one point, because I know there's so much stuff we could do. And one thing we even have talked about, I love the positive vibe you all have. Um, I, 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 I can see there's a lot of energy and humor in it. And we actually had a session on humor at one time and, and that's a topic by itself. So I, I love that. That was so great. I just want to remind everybody, guys, we have another session next week where we're talking about the need to create a negotiation strategy. And we have a COO of a major European construction company who have implemented our negotiation strategy. Tim and I um, uh, often talk about that and often disagree. And one of the things that Tim and I have disagreed on is if whether we need a chief negotiation officer. I think, John, you were involved in that debate at one point. So uh, we also disagree sometimes whether we need a negotiation strategy, but more about that next week. Um, Jennifer, Arthur, Mike, John, thank you so much for today. I loved it. It was outstanding. Uh, I appreciate you guys. Um, keep doing what you're doing. And please teach other generations all the stuff you have so we can improve the way we all negotiate. I, I would I would appreciate that. Thank you so much for, for today, Bye. guys. Thank, thank you for you. attending. Thank you thank for you. having thank us. You. Thanks for having us. This was great. Very thank enjoyable. you. Bye.